It was called the Atomic Age, and despite its horrific beginnings, it held great possibilities. Some dreamed of unlimited energy to run the world and change our lives for the better. Or perhaps harnessing the terrifying power into a radioactive weapon that could destroy cancerous tumors. Fifty years later, those hopes have faded. The promise of unlimited power never overcame the image that if something went wrong, nuclear reactors might explode like the bomb. And we found they produced waste that was very hard to get rid of. The scientists who dreamed those first dreams wonder if it's too late to tell everyone they've solved those problems, that the atomic age is finally ready to begin. When the bomb exploded in 1945, the world changed forever. With peace came the challenge to use atomic power for peaceful purposes. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. It began here, on a broad desert plain in the middle of Idaho, where government began research and experimentation to create the first nuclear reactor which would produce electricity. Scientists believed they had an unlimited source of energy for the entire world. This episode of The New Explorers is about a dream to save the world and the curious 50-year journey to use atoms for peace. This is the newest ghost town in the West, the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Richland, Washington. Nine nuclear reactors stand idle. For years, they produced the plutonium for weapons to fight the Cold War. But that role is now history. With the Cold War over, the work here has turned to the job of cleaning up the radioactive waste left behind. It's the legacy of the use of atomic power for war. But there is another story here, often overshadowed by the threat of the bomb. It too was born and raised in the atomic age. It's the story of using atomic power for peace. And even though the efforts to harness the power have entered our lives in many ways, from cancer treatments to 100 million nuclear medicine tests every year in the United States, there are scientists who fear their achievements to use atoms for peace are becoming part of the ghost town. Like this, a very special place in the 50-year-long journey to turn nuclear power into unlimited energy for the world. Charles Till is a nuclear physicist with Argonne National Laboratory, one of ten research and development laboratories run by the U.S. Department of Energy. He believes his team of research scientists have found answers to the public's fears of nuclear power. But their discoveries may be too late. This was to be the next generation of nuclear uh, plants in this country. You mean all these dials uh, we see are shut off? I see off, off, off on the graphs? For a year now. For a year? Mm -hmm. Charles Till makes a rather astounding claim that his reactor is inherently safe and recycles most of its waste, designed to put endless energy at our fingertips with no air pollution, no greenhouse effect. But even more astounding, last year, Congress cut off funding to this nuclear research, ending an incredible chapter of experimentation and exploration in America. 
The Japanese, in fact, are pursuing the basic uh, elements of, of this technology. And while these ideas were ideas of Argonne National Laboratory and the people here, the Japanese would be very likely to, to be able to succeed in, in the development. But I think that as, a, as an American, that's to be regretted. His feelings are echoed by colleagues and supporters. Yes, Dick Lindsay has worked at Argonne for more than 30 years. This is the end. It has collapsed now to here. There's not large activities going on anymore in, in nuclear power research. We're giving it away. But why? What went wrong? How could a technology that appeared so promising slip away? To begin to understand, we need to travel back more than 50 years to when young scientists felt like new explorers. In 1942, German soldiers were making their push into Russia. Scientists in the United States were afraid the Nazis were working on a special bomb. A select group of some of the world's finest nuclear physicists secretly met in a squash court underneath the west stands of an unused football field at the University of Chicago. Albert Wattenberg was one of the research assistants. Some of the other young guys like myself discussed what we would do if, they, if the Nazis got the bombs before us. They certainly would wipe out the uh, British very quickly, or the British would capitulate very quickly, so they could walk in. It was a race, and the man in charge was up to the challenge, Enrico Fermi, a Nobel Prize winning physicist. It was Fermi who figured out what needed to be built, the world's first self-sustaining nuclear reactor, a pile of graphite laced with uranium. They worked around the clock in two shifts. The man on the right is Bob Nobles. You were all dirty with graphite. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that floor. Uh -huh. See, we had graphite all piled around the edges, and the way we, we developed a way of transferring. People would get over here and shove it on the floor. It would slide like a bowling ball. <laughs> you had to be very careful to keep your fingers out. <laughs> we had many the crushed road. fingers. <laughs> the experiment was designed to test a theory about the atom. Beneath a cloud of electrons in the nucleus of each atom are protons and neutrons. Scientists already knew that if a neutron from one atom blasted into an atom of uranium-235, the atom would split in a process called fission, producing new elements, tremendous energy, and also more neutrons. Fermi's idea was to bring together enough uranium so that a chain reaction would occur where neutrons split atoms, making more neutrons available to split more atoms. In this way, millions of atoms could fission almost at once, producing tremendous energy. In Fermi's reactor, the graphite served as a moderator, a material that slows the neutrons to ensure they hit uranium atoms to cause the chain reaction. To control the rate of the chain reaction, Wooden rods were wrapped in cadmium, a metal that soaks up neutrons. As the control rods were pushed in, the reaction would decrease. Pulled out, the way would be clear to increase. It was the same principle that would control every reactor built from then on. On December 2nd, 1942, the reactor was ready to be tested. Fermi called the shots. All the control rods were pulled out except one, and that one was moved slowly out, incrementally, all morning. As the tension rose, Fermi called a break for lunch. We went, came back about two o'clock and then repeated, you know, just slowly pulling 